Welcome to Gridability, a podcast about the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. I'm your host, Adam Clausen. I was sentenced to 213 years in federal prison. It took me 20 years, five months, 17 days to earn my second chance. And really it was me developing gridability, the skill that allowed me to make it through that 20 years and come out the other side to have the life of my dreams. And I am really excited today to have here in the studio with me um, what I feel is the ultimate example of gridability and is central to me becoming the person that I am today because she has truly inspired me every day for many, many years. And previously I've shared my story. I talked a lot about myself and I only touched on my relationship. The relationship that started when I was behind those 40 foot walls of United States Penitentiary, facing down that 213 year sentence, when at times it seemed like all hope was lost. And I really struggled at times to to figure out, you know, what my motivation was going to be, what was going to keep me focused, what was going to inspire me to keep doing the difficult work on a daily basis to become the person that I needed to be, who was worthy of that second chance, and who was equipped to come out here and to pursue all of my dreams, all of my goals, and to really have the life that I envisioned for myself. So central to that was my beautiful and charismatic and just amazing wife, Ro Clausen. She's here with me today. What an intro. <laughs> well, hello, podcast. I'm very excited to do this. We've done this a few times, very differently though, and I've never been in the hot seat, so I'm kind of excited. All right. And nervous. Not really. <laughs> no, not nervous. So... Um, she's had much more experience being on camera than me. So everything that, that I, you know, I'm coming in here with, I've, I've learned from her. So she is the pro at this. And, you know, I do really want to talk about your time on camera and what that evolved out of. But bef before we get into all of that, uh, I really want to go back to the beginning because for those who have already listened previously to, to my story, uh, on Action Junkies, the background, and heard me throughout the first couple podcasts here talk about, you know, me developing that skill, that grit ability, what it took to become the person that I am today, to live the life of my dreams. Um, as I said, she is central to it. So our story, I think, is a great place for us to start this interview. And, and as Rose said, we have shared this story a number of times but today, I want to hear it a little bit more from her perspective. So I'm just going to be quiet and let her tell, and I'll just chime in as needed, how we initially met, because that's always the question. I mean, I was serving a life sentence. So how was it that you and I met? Oh, wow. Okay. So there are different versions of this story. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess this is the first time ever that we'll tell the real version of the story. And the reason, let's start here. The reason why there are different versions of this story is because back when I was advocating for you to come home, I started advocating online. And I had to fabricate part of our story because I had to fill out this questionnaire. Is it a questionnaire? Like an application sort of? Yeah. To come visit Adam. And on the application, one of the questions was, how long have you known this person? Did you know them before their incarceration? And majority of them, if not back then, I think all of them were getting denied, right? Yeah, they were getting denied if you did not know the person before their incarceration. So I told a little white lie <laughs> and I said that we knew each other before. And so we developed this story that I used online. Surprise, we did not know each other before. So for everybody coming over from Strong Prison Wives and Families, that's kind of a fabricated story because otherwise I would not have been able to go visit you. And, and just for the record, yeah. um, I think it was like seven years um, 
what is what is that called um, that you have to charge someone for for false? Oh, statute of limitations. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's only a seven year for, statute of limitations on hard. that. <laughs> I'm and, gonna go to jail for. A and long. we have a long exceeded that, so there's there's no concern about that at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the actual story is, so I had a very, very dear friend. She, I called her my cousin at the time because our mothers grew up together mm. and her boyfriend at the time wound up getting locked up. And I remember this so vividly. I'm sitting on her front porch. It's August. We're in New Jersey. Like the whole Jersey shore thing is going on. Like we really lived that life. And so I was hanging out with this guy down the shore and he wound up being a player. So I'm on her front porch and I'm like crying over this guy that's using me at the time. And she's like, listen, my boyfriend just wound up meeting this guy. Why don't you talk to him? He's inside, you know? And I'm like, for what? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> and she goes, come on. She's like, just send him an email. Because at the time you had just gotten emails mm -hmm. into the prison. Just send him an email. Just, you know, it's, it's like this situation. You can bounce stuff off, stuff off of him. And I'm like, no, <laughs> really, I have no desire. So I left her front porch, probably crying, went home, slept on it. And the next morning I was like, you know what? Just give him my email address. That's fine. We can communicate over email. So we did. And as we started communicating and these emails started going really deep, I was like, uh oh, like I'm in trouble, right? Because every time I would see that an email came through from you, I would get these butterflies in my stomach and I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> this is really not very good. Um, and then I think it was only about two or three weeks later, it was Labor Day, I think. And so what happened was when you could visit, you could visit where you were at the time, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then federal holidays that fell on Mondays, you could visit. So she's like, why don't you come with me? We'll do this visit. We'll go Saturday, Sunday, but we could also go on Monday because you have off of work. They have an extra visit. So I was like, okay, I might as well. I mean, now we're like communicating on this deep level. I have to figure this out, like see what's going on here. And so I did. I submitted the form with the lie on it. I got approved. Somehow they let me in there. <laughs> and yeah, and we visited and that's how it started. Mm, well, maybe I should share a little bit about being on the other side of it because that same friend, well, let me back up. I get a call from one of the guys on my housing unit while I'm in this United States penitentiary. They said, hey, there's this big bodybuilder from New Jersey that just showed up. You need to talk to him. So at the time, I'm, I'm the fitness guy. So anyone who's got, you know, any connection to fitness, to working out, they, they send them all my way. And the fact that this guy is from New Jersey, where I was from as well, made that connection because you have people from all over the country in the federal system. So they send this guy to me and he's, you know, big jacked up guy, clearly, you know, serious bodybuilder. And, you know, we, we hit it off initially and he starts telling me about his girlfriend and you know, within the first week or two, he's already like telling me about his girlfriend's got a friend, it's her cousin. And hey, wouldn't it be great if they drove up here together because it's three and a half hours. You know, it's, it's a drive. And basically, he wanted to make sure that his girlfriend had someone to make the trip. That's kind of what I was gauging, right? He wasn't worried about me. Um, I'm a guy serving a life sentence, right? Who tries to hook a friend up? with a guy that's serving life, right? That's not uh, questionable. So when he initially tells me this, believe it or not, I'm kind of resistant to it. I don't know anything about, you know, who this person is, who this woman is. And the only description that he gives me is that she likes to work out too and she's got quite a lat spread. And I'm like, wow, that's a heck of a selling point, her lats. I'm like, she must be into working out, right? So in my mind, I'm thinking Xena warrior princess with guns out to here, traps, lats. I'm like, you know, she might be a little intimidating. So I try and put that in the back of my mind because to be honest, I was, I was working on being much less shallow than I had been in my youth and all of my relationships were extremely shallow. Um, and you know this, we've had this conversation plenty of times. 
So for the first time, I said, you know, when it was brought up, well, why don't you guys just email? I said, you know, I've never really had any sort of interaction with a woman where it was literally just, you know, an exchange, pure communication, getting to know one, one another. And I said, what, what's the harm in that? So we started communicating. And as you said, those emails, I quickly realized, uh-oh, like, I'm really into this woman. And in the back of my mind, Xena warrior princess, <laughs> I'm like, oh God, like I, I, I know more about her than I do with all of the other women I've dated combined in a very short period of time, just because of the depth of our exchanges. And to me, I was like, I was just so intrigued. I'm like, I, I need to meet this woman. I need to meet her in person. Um, regardless of the fact if I go out there and she is intimidating and she's a little bit bigger than me and you know maybe uh, puts me in a chokehold I mean I'll deal with that so uh when that first visit when we talked about that first weekend where you just left off um going into that I gotta be honest I was a little I was more than a little I was a lot nervous and it was Friday afternoon of that weekend last day for mail to come through for the week and 4.30, right after count, I get a bing, bing, bing on my door. Here comes his big bodybuilder barging through the, through the door, and he's got mail in his hand, and he slaps it down on my desk. He's like, look, look, I got pictures. And I'm like, pictures? I'm like, we're, we're going to see him tomorrow. And I remember, like, my chest got tight. I caught my breath. I'm like, am I ready to see these pictures? I have, I realized in that moment how much I already had invested in the relationship that we had built simply by communicating. And so I really had to pause. I remember consciously like, just relax. It doesn't matter. Like you are really, you know, enjoying this exchange. It doesn't matter what she looks like. It's not about aesthetics. Don't even stress. Don't worry about it. So he, opens, he rips open this envelope and he pulls it out and he goes, look, look at that. Look at the styrations in her legs. <laughs> and I'm like, I pause, I look and I go, oh my God, she's absolutely gorgeous. And it was, Thank the, you. it was the picture of you right after you won the Miss Fitness, Miss New Jersey, and you're holding up the American flag behind you. And granted, you were... You were in incredible shape, but you were no Xena. <laughs> so, uh, and then he flipped through a, a few more pictures and I'm like, oh my God, she's absolutely beautiful. She is everything outside that I have already seen inside. Oh God, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so my response was pretty much the same. And you've been in trouble ever since. Ever since. <laughs> So I'm going to open this door because I'm an open book. I've done so many of these interviews and I've made so many videos very vulnerable on YouTube. So I'm going to start here and say this. I think because of that, because we had that physical aspect of our relationship, I don't want to say ripped away from us because it was never even there. I think that allowed us to communicate on such a deep level and open up about things that for me personally, dating somebody for a couple years, I don't think I ever was able to open up about. I think that allowed us to become so close, kind of like that show Love is Blind on Netflix that's really popular right now. And I think they stole our story. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, so I, I just kind of wanted to throw that in there to allow you to open it up to ask me the hard questions. Mm. Well, listen. First and foremost, I'm sure anyone tuning into this is going to want to know, first, how long are we talking about? When when did this relationship start? 2009. 2009. Yeah. And what year did I finally get released from prison? 2020. Okay. Right? Does... <laughs> wow. That's not a mind blower. And just for the record, I had a life sentence that whole time. Well, no, what? Till the week before I got out, two yeah. weeks before, two weeks in, before my release. That's when we finally got rid of the life sentence and then had to figure out how much time I was going to get. So even at that point, it could have been another 10, 15, 20 
years, no telling. Yeah, and in those 11 years, those two weeks were the hardest part by far. Mm. We'll get ahead to those to those years in, or to those couple of weeks in, in just a minute. But I want, I want to go back to, to the beginning, really. So let's start with that first visit where I think clearly both of us, we've talked about this, um, where we were both attracted to one another, wanted to continue this relationship. But wait a minute, I'm serving a life sentence no chance of parole. This is the federal system. And you're coming in, let me just paint this picture, just to get inside this facility, right? What you had to go through as far as security, checkpoints, as you said, you know, you talked about filling out the, the background information, which they run background on everyone to make sure that you don't have any criminal convictions. They, I mean, they even checked your driving record, everything. It's a little bit different in the federal system. They take it much more seriously. So for you having the courage to just based on that exchange of emails to say, you know what, I'm going to take the trip out there three and a half hours. I'm going to go through everything that I know that I have to go through just to get in there to see if this is real, to spend a, a couple hours, honestly, because that's what it was, a couple hours in person with this guy to see if, to see if there's substance here. Tell me what that thought process was like and how you made that determination. I honestly had no idea where I was going, where I was. I mean, I obviously knew I was going to visit somebody in prison and I knew I was in a prison visiting room. But at the same time, I think it was this huge load of denial that you were never getting out and all this stuff. I knew it, but I also knew that I needed to explore what I was feeling and what was going on between us, no matter what that turned into. And I remember specifically after our first visit, one of my girlfriends was like, meet me for lunch. Let's talk through this. And she was one of my closest friends. So she was like, girl, <laughs> what are you doing? But in a very nice way. And I remember specifically, we were sitting in her car outside of a pizzeria in the parking lot. And she's like, well, tell me, how did it go? And I was like, Karen, he's perfect. But it wasn't like a, oh yeah, he's perfect. You know, I met the love of my life, which I did, but it's, he's perfect. And it's this cruel joke because I can never have him. And she said to me, why don't you for the first time ever just follow your heart and see where it takes you? She said, you are such a people pleaser and you've been living for everybody else for so long. Why don't just for once live in the moment, live day to day and just see where your heart takes you. And I was like, wow, for somebody so young, that was such a forward thinking, mature thought. And that's what I did. And that's what I did at every visit. Was it easy? No. I mean, looking back, I'm like, oh, it was no big deal. But we had this one cop that would check us in. And I don't know if he had a problem with you. I don't know if he had a problem with me. I don't know if he just didn't like guys on the inside getting visits. And he always always made a big deal out of me getting in. Whether it was what I was wearing that day didn't work. One day it was where I parked my car was wrong. Although it was where I parked every single week for every week I'd been coming for the amount of time I've been coming. So that was a problem. I remember one time, this was, remember, way back 2009, and I'm wearing leggings and Ugg boots because that's what was hot at the time and, I don't know, a sweater or something. And he tells me, well, you're not allowed in wearing those pants. So I learned at this point, I always brought backup outfits and then backup outfits for my backup outfits. And then I brought like a nun outfit just in case none of those worked. So, and it's weird because you're on this, what's considered a date, right? And you want to look your best and you want to feel your best, but half the time you're going in like shirt backwards, inside out just to get in. So it's this frantic feeling of, I want to look good, but I also have to get in there. So it's, it's bizarre, but I remember, I forgot my... <laughs> my point I do this all the time where was I you were talking about the challenges of just getting in the door oh yeah okay so he tells me you're not allowed to wear that and I, okay so I go in and I go to get my backup outfit and I come back out and there's this woman wearing pretty much the exact same replica of what I was wearing that I just changed out of and he lets her go through and he looks me in the eye like huh 
And here's the thing, you cannot give them attitude. I mean, you can try, but at the end of the day, they have all of the power. So you're kind of playing with fire. And I always told people that I would coach through going this, doing this, like, you have to choose your battles. Is this one you want to fight or is this one that you don't want to fight? And what you're wearing it to visit is not one that you want to fight. So it was, you know, it was challenging, but you learned the ropes and I learned how to get in there. And it was, there was a little bit of anxiety going in every time. But then once I knew I was through the metal detector, it was fine. I was in, we were good. Mm, you just really summarized. That was a process that you went through for how many years? It total oh, yeah. 11, yeah. 11 years of doing that every time you wanted just to come in and spend a couple hours with me. I, that's what I want to highlight. Yeah. Not that's one component of our relationship. The fact that you were driving initially, it was say three and a half hours each way when I was at the United States Penitentiary. Then when I got moved to a quote unquote better place, and just to be clear, Better is, I mean, that's, I use that term very loosely, right? To a better place where the highlight was we could actually hold hands. And to me, that was the most intimate contact I had ever had. As crazy as that's going to sound, simply holding hands was like after spending over a year, you know, separated by a table that was larger than this not allowed to really touch except very briefly at the beginning, at the end. I, I think that helps to put it in context, right? Like what you were willing to go through, subject yourself to the stress, the anxiety, the actual process that you had to go through to then just spend this short amount of time where we were able to be together in person. That's one component, right? The other part of this is outside of those visits, because that was really, that was the highlight, I would say, of our relationship getting to spend that time in person. But what about all the other hours, right? This is a long distance relationship where we're together for these brief periods, but then all the rest of this time where you still have to like life, right? You're juggling life. And, I, and I've been frank about this. For me, all of my years on the inside, there was extreme benefit to me. like. For the most part, I got to choose my schedule. The books that we see on the shelves behind us, I, I had the opportunity to read all of those books, to learn the things that I felt I needed to know to, to improve my place in life, to, um, to do all of the things that I envisioned for myself. So I had that opportunity, whereas you were juggling life, all of the responsibilities. You come from a big family where there's all these other dynamics and you know, you're going to take on this relationship that is actually, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of challenge. So how did you deal with that? Those other hours outside of visit? I think bringing it back to gritability is huge. So all these other people had these countdowns and they knew that they just had to get through a certain stretch of months or years or whatever it was until their loved one came home. For me, I decided, well, I don't have those countdowns, so I'm going to make my countdown the time between visits. Because in the beginning, I used to go every week, but then that was only nine months or so. Then you moved six hours away. I tried to go every two weeks. It just was way too much. So I decided to go once a month. So what am I going to do in these four weeks between visits to make that visit, I'm going to be a better person in four weeks than I am today. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it was cramming a lot into that. So I was, I did, I worked out a ton. People always ask me like, how'd you deal with not being intimate for so many years? I worked out a lot. So I always set those physical goals. I would, you know, have a challenge. What am I going to do in these four weeks physically? But also, what am I going to do emotionally? What am I going to do to better myself? What goals am I going to set and attain within these four weeks? And that's really what I did. But I, like you said, I had my family. My mom was really sick at that point. So I was taking care of my mom. Um, what else did I do? Oh, <laughs> I started a nonprofit. <laughs> oh, yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. Please, please e explain a little bit about that because I, I think um, that's another, it's, a huge part it speaks to your ability to to use this time this opportunity not only to for yourself but 
the number of other lives that you impacted by creating this support community. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? So I remember in the beginning, there are so many things when you're dealing with a prison relationship, not even just visiting, like, what do I wear? But rules and emotions and stuff that you just don't understand. So when I would try to tell somebody in the outside world, the free world, we'll call it, about my relationship, our relationship, people didn't understand. At best, they would kind of just yes me. And at worst, they would say these cruel things to my face, which, you know, in hindsight, I'm like, I get it, right? They thought based on their life, what was, they were dictate what was best for me, but it wasn't. So I didn't want to do that anymore. I kind of just shied away from telling people about our relationship, especially because you were a lifer. So that's, it's another extra layer of what the hell are you doing? (laughs) So I decided one day, now this is back in 2009. Remember YouTube just came out in 2006. So social media isn't at that, at that time, it wasn't like it is today. So I looked online for anybody that was going through what I was going through and there really wasn't much out there. And what was out there was living into this ride or die Bonnie and Clyde criminal lifestyle. And they were living into this stigma that I was trying so desperately to break, to live outside of. So I said, if it's not there, right, there have to be people like me out there. If it's not there, then I'm going to build it. And that's what I slowly did. So I started, at that point, I started a YouTube channel and I met up with this girl that had a blog and we joined forces and eventually it started to take off and people started to find us. And again, 2009, we were growing by like 500 people a day, which back then was huge. Not like the TikTok generation where you're getting a million followers a month or something like that. So um, it took off and we, the next step about 2011, we decided if we're going to make this thing grow, then we have to turn it into a nonprofit. And that's what I did. And so that's what I poured a lot of my energy into during those times in between visits, during visits all the time. And I think number one, it was to use this experience and do something constructive with it. Because if I got to the point where I was pouring all of this time into it, and you never came home because that was a possibility, then at least I knew that I was using this injustice and doing something constructive with it. I was giving it a purpose. I wanted to control it because within our relationship, there were so many restrictions and there were so many confines around what we were able to do and not do. I had no control over anything. So I was going to have control over something and I was going to do something good with it. And eventually I knew that there was going to be enough good to outweigh the bad of your past, that we would somehow, in some way, get through it, and we did. Wow, I love that. Um, I love the sense of being able to find your purpose in in contributing, and what you said about taking control, because there were so many things that were outside of our control throughout that period in our lives. Incredibly challenging when you talk about being incarcerated and you know really not having the ability to to make certain choices so i was always looking for ways to exercise that that personal agency right and for you to be on the outside to feel that you are similarly constrained and to then go about finding those opportunities um, to focus on what you could impact And I don't want to overlook the fact that you, the laws that I was there under, complicated federal laws, that despite my best efforts, I tried to explain these laws to so many people and they just didn't make sense. Mandatory minimum sentences that were stacked, meaning they ran consecutive to one another. That's how I ended up with this crazy sentence. And you, for your part, went to great lengths to really understand those laws, to be able to articulate, you know, why I was there for that time. That was a, you know, a big undertaking. And then to go out there and to publicly advocate, um, to go to the White House, candlelight vigil, 2016. Um, It looks like maybe, possibly, I might be able to get clemency President Barack Obama is on his way out of office. They're having what people are calling a a clemency lottery, right? It's like they're pulling names out of a hat. 
and some people are getting put on this list and and their sentences are getting overturned they're getting immediate release or they're getting released in a couple years um and it looked like we were in the running i mean we were told that my petition was at the white house and i have this picture of you my mother and amy pova from can do clemency and malik um, one of the people who also works with her standing out front of the white house candlelight vigil trying to get the president's attention like hey literally we're out here please pay attention um so close and then it didn't work out tell me a little bit about that because i know if if you want to talk about being feeling like we were finally right there like the dream that we envisioned for ourselves that we had talked about it really detailed up to this point because we had a release plan which had to be submitted you know what was that going to look like when i walked out the door so we had spent a lot of time talking about it there was all this mm, energy leading up to it and then it didn't it just died it died on that night when he left office and then what tell me about what that process was like how difficult it was to then move on from that point so i said earlier that the last two weeks before your release were the hardest two weeks of the whole entire stretch of 11 years and i think it's because it felt like i was reliving that the clemency process. So that was the second most difficult. And, and I'm talking like, I've been through some stuff. And these were the most difficult experiences of my whole entire life. So I remember vividly being at my desk at work and just not being able to control it and starting to cry. And I'm not a crier. I'm not the type of person that wears my emotion on my sleeve. You will not know if I'm having a bad day, if, if I can help it. And I literally couldn't help it. So I would have to run off to the ladies room and collect myself. And because like you said, we were planning to come pick you up, like basically bags packed, everything going. And we were told not only that it was in the White House, but that your petition was on the vice president's desk. And we just ran out of time. So I think two days later, I had a doctor's appointment. I had just had surgery on my foot and it was the inauguration on the TV. Now, again, I'm trying to fake it, having conversation with these adorable girls that are at like, the reception desk and I'm trying to fake it. And they're talking about like what everyone's wearing and how cute all the girls looked. And I'm trying to participate in this conversation and I just feel it like bubbling because I knew the minute that that happened, because we were told, oh, there's going to be this secret list that comes out right before they swear in the new president. So as time's ticking, right, and the inauguration's happening and they're just about to swear him in, the clock's running out and I'm trying to fake it and I just felt it. It's bubbling up and I was going to lose it. And this persisted for probably two weeks, two weeks of feeling sorry for myself, two weeks of just spontaneously going into tears. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I think I'm done. So you would always tell me from day one, sleep on it. Everything always looks better in the morning. And that's what I would do. And back to my girlfriend's advice, way back in the car outside of the pizzeria in the parking lot in 2009, when I met you, I took it one day at a time and I followed my heart. And I knew this wasn't it. And I'm such a fighter. I wasn't throwing in the towel for this. I always knew you didn't have life on the books. You didn't have something indefinite. You had this crazy 213 year sentence. And people who did have life on the books did stuff that was so much worse. I knew that somebody would hear us one day. So it was just a matter of waking up, getting up, being so cliche in saying, like brushing myself off and just moving forward and coming up with a plan. And you were always so good at walking me through that. And sometimes I would shoot off these emails that were <laughs> two liners of like, I can't do this anymore <laughs> because of motion, right? And then we just worked through it and we set ourselves up for our next goal and we look towards it and we just kept going. Mm. Wow. That you just described like what I have talked about developing gritability as a skill, going through that process, making it a habit to wake up every single day, 
you know, to prepare yourself mentally and, and just get in a good space and face those difficult things, knowing that, you know, you have an outcome in mind, but just knowing that you're going to face those challenges, getting comfortable, being uncomfortable. And I would say that's largely, I mean, not largely, that's solely, that's why we're here right now together because there's plenty of other couples that we met along the way that weren't as fortunate. They weren't as fortunate, and I'm not going to attribute it to luck. I'm going to say it was very, very intentional. There were things that we did repeatedly day after day to improve ourselves, to build our relationship, and to make sure that we were ready, that we were in the best position possible, that when that opportunity came, we'd be prepared for it. Yeah. So when I did walk out the door after those couple of excruciating weeks... And I, we're summarizing a lot right now because we didn't even touch. There are so many other things in your personal life. We really just covered the things that were central to us, to our relationship, but we didn't even talk about the other challenges, the amazing um, resilience you've shown in all other aspects of your life. And unfortunately, we don't have time to get into all of those today, but those are things that having you on as my co-host from this point forward, I know that we're going to have plenty of opportunities to talk about those things, to talk about your personal experiences and to incorporate those into our conversations. And I'm really excited for us to be moving forward and taking this another, another giant step forward in something that we talked about years ago. This is the fulfillment of one of those things that we said we were going to do. So the fact that we are here now doing it, that this is the first time, this is another thing for us to celebrate and, and to talk about just the things that we put into practice because even on the way here this morning, <laughs> there, was, <laughs> there was some challenges. Like there are still daily challenges and me feeling comfortable enough that I can share openly what I'm feeling with you and for you to be able to coach me through it and to work through it with me. Um, like I could not ask for anything more in a partner in life, a greater inspiration and a better first guest who demonstrates more credibility than, than I have, right. Than I've expressed, um, I just feel fortunate to have you here with me today. And I'm excited for, you know, whatever we have from this point forward, um, all of the other individuals that we'll have the opportunity to talk about, share their experiences, uh, and to be able to incorporate more of ours, to tell more of your personal story, share more of our background and how it relates to us talking about developing gridability as a skill, the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. I feel like this has been another great podcast, but really just the beginning of us, you know, sharing some of those stories. And uh, is there anything you want to say in closing as we take this out of here? I feel like you just reproposed to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. I'm really excited. And you're right. This is something that we've dreamed about for a really long time. So it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Looking forward to it. We thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you right back here on Gridability.